there, everyone. This is video three for Finance 6300, Intro to Venture Capital. Here is our agenda. We're going to recap uh, what we covered in the previous videos and then talk uh, this time about the valuation formula. So to recap, um, we learned that business is not a dirty word. We learned that technology is about an idea for making things better and an execution of that idea. We spoke about how public markets are the most advanced technology for funding companies and how the context of this course uh, is understanding the company, the context, the investor, and the deal. We talked about three main types of asset valuation, income, asset, and market approach. And we talked about how most startup valuation techniques are rooted in the market-based approach. We talked about why uh, public companies are worth more than private companies, that the key is that they offer greater liquidity to investors, and how getting investors to put their money in is a function of a compelling opportunity and a reason to believe. And that brought us to this point, uh, the vexing questions that hinge on valuation. So this video will take valuation a step further and discuss common valuation heuristics. That does it for our recap. On to new material. With the basic backdrop and motivation for venture capital under our belt, let's move into a more tactical look at some of the tools you can use. We'll kick this section off with a video from HBO's Silicon Valley. Well, it's like Gavin always says, you know, it, it takes change to make change. Uh, yeah, I think I've seen that written around. Yeah. Hey, I, uh, I... Gavin is running 30 minutes late, but you should know he is very excited to see you, Richard. Uh, he's with his spiritual advisor. He shouldn't be that much longer. I mean, I'm a VP here, and I only get to see him about 10 minutes a month. Yeah, but that 10 minutes is just incredible. I heard Richard Hendricks was here. Uh, Have you ever met Gavin before? No. No? Oh, I told him. It's amazing. That hardly begins to describe it. And Gavin said, I'm not humiliating you. I'm elevating you. Oh, Gavin. <laughs> this is Richard. It's Peter Gregory. It, uh, no, I'm actually outside of Gavin Belson's office right now, Mr. Gregory. Uh, here he comes, so can I call you back in a second? So, Richard Hendricks is here. There you are, Richard. I... So sorry these gentlemen have kept you waiting. So, here's the thing. I love what you did. Really? Fill them in, Jared. Now, as you know, Hooli is seen as possibly the most progressive company in the world. Mm -hmm. Part of that is Gavin's commitment to social justice. But part of it is his personal commitment to the people that work at Hooli. In that spirit, Gavin is prepared to give you a very substantial raise and a promotion to go with it. I own 10%. He created it while living in my incubator. Ehrlich Bachman. This is Big Head. I don't know what any of that means, but I'll give you $600,000 for it. We have the reach and the resources to take what you have done and push it to the global level. That is a generous offer. I, um... Sorry. Well? <clears throat> really? That's cr... Uh, yeah, yeah, no, here. It's, uh, it's Peter Gregory. Not sure how he got my number. Uh, this is Richard. I'll give you $3 million for it right now. Uh, 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 Gavin Belson just offered me $3 million for Pied Piper. I'm prepared to give you $300,000. Peter Gregory just offered me three hundred. Um, uh, uh, did you say thousand? For 10% of your company. Okay, four million. 200,000 for 5%. Huh? Yeah, uh, you, have, you just went down. No. You're still valued at $4 million, but you own 95% of a potential billion-dollar company. And not just that. I will help you build this company. I will introduce you to the people you need to know and provide the counsel that you need. I will take a small piece, but the company will belong to you. Not Gavin Nelson. You have until tomorrow to decide. Uh... Okay. I'm offering you $4 million right now. Hmm. I'm... That is a lot of money. 
Uh, you know, I actually have to... I've got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> got to pee. Uh, there's a desperate. I'm bursting. I'll be right back, but uh, right now... Okay, 10 million! No. Maybe. I didn't mean to snap at you. I I'll, we'll, I'll talk in a bit. Won't be long. So, you will survive. It's just a garden variety panic attack. Welcome to Silicon Valley. We see people like you all the time. Really? Yes. Let's just have to make this decision by tomorrow. Yeah. You know, a while back, we had a guy in here in almost the exact same situation. Take the money or keep the company. What happened? Well, a couple months later, he was brought into the ER with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. I guess he really regretted not taking that money. He, he shot himself because he turned down the money? Yeah. Or no, no he took the money. Or no. I, no, he did not. I don't, you know what? I don't remember. But whatever it was, he regretted it so much that he ended up shooting himself, and now he's blind. <laughs> so the video raises an interesting question. How do founders and investors get on the same page about valuation? Here's a more real-world example. We'll use Mark Zuckerberg as our founder. Entrepreneurs are questioning whether or not they're giving up too much equity. Are they being taken by these savvy investors who almost always have more experience than they do? Investors actually have a pretty tough question to solve themselves. They're attempting to look into the future and see where is this company going. So here's Ben Horowitz, uh, a, a genuine early investor in Facebook, and we'll use him as our investor example. Um, he's also one of the partners of Andreessen Horowitz, which is one of the, the best-known uh, venture capital firms in Silicon Valley. So for investors, the big question is, how much equity do I need in order to get my retired, my required rate of return? What we really need to figure out is how do we get these two on the same page? Well, one way to do that is to use the valuation formula outlined in, in this article from the Harvard Business Review. The full article is posted on Canvas if you want to read it. This formula aims to create parity between founders and entrepreneurs in assessing a company's valuation. So let's break it down. It's pretty simple. There's a numerator and a denominator. The numerator looks like this. It's 1 plus the IRR raised to the number of years to exit times the amount of the investment. This tells us how much the investor's planned investment will be worth assuming the required IRR. The denominator is the value of the entire company at exit. This is calculated by using a multiple for a key metric or exit value. The key thing is that the numerator divided by the denominator gives us a hurdle rate. The hurdle rate is the minimum percent of ownership the investor needs in order to, for the investment to generate the required internal rate of return. So let's break down each of the terms. IRR is the desired internal rate of return. For purposes of this class, we will always use 100% IRR unless another IRR is specified. The reason for that is that just to stay alive, VC funds need to return 20 to 30% IRR across their entire portfolio. But venture is risky, and some of those portfolio companies are not gonna make it. If three in five fail, if one of them breaks even, and one generates an IRR of 100% or greater, the average return will be about 25%. So 100% is a good rule of thumb. The exponent x is time, uh, that is, the number of years anticipated until exit. The investment is the amount of money the investor is putting into the company, and the multiple represents uh, an industry multiple that we will apply to a key metric in the business, like revenue or earnings. And the exit value is that key metric um, at the time of exit. So if we use, uh, for example, three years for our time to exit, we want to use the revenue or earnings projected three years from now times the revenue or earnings multiple in order to get the, de the denominator. For starters, we're going to use these heuristics for our, our multiples. So there are industry averages for every industry, um, but this is a great place to start as you're getting used to uh, doing valuation. So if you don't have an industry average multiple, then use these. For private companies, we'll value them at one times revenue or five times earnings. Public companies we know are valued higher because they offer more liquidity for investors. So we'll value them at five times revenue or 20 times earnings. These are just heuristics, so if you have actual industry average multiples, as I said before, that's always preferable. But if you don't have one, these will get you into the ballpark. Now, even though this is simple, it's super important, so you want to make sure you get this. For instance, if the company will have earnings of a million dollars in three years and it's a private company, we might value the company at five times earnings, or five million dollars. 
or we could use revenue. Let's say the company will generate $3 million in revenues in the third year, and we're using a one times multiple for private companies. That means the company is valued at $3 million in the third year. There are other methods for valuing a company. If you have, if you have access to these, uh, they can be substituted in the denominator in the valuation formula. The first two we've already used in our example, revenue and earnings. Um, we could use book value. Uh, we could use a flavor of earnings like EBITDA or EBIT. Uh, we could use market cap, net income. Uh, we could use MRR or ARR, which are popular if the company is growing very fast. Let's take a look at a couple of uh, examples. Refer back to this section if you're still unsure how to do this. You, wanna, you want to know how to calculate the valuation formula. There will be story problems and things like that in the, in the uh, quiz that will require that you're able to do this. So make sure you, that, that you've reviewed this and understand it. So let's take a look at these examples. One example is a private company. It is valued, uh, we're going to value it on earnings. You can see the anticipated revenue and earnings picture here over the next four years. So let's assume we have a $50,000 investment with an exit in three years. Uh, plug in the appropriate info into the formula and we have one plus one for 100% IRR to the power of three uh, for our three year exit multiplied by the amount of the investment which is 50,000. For the denominator, we'll use the private earnings multiple of five multiplied by the anticipated earnings in year three, which is 120,000. So if we multiply that out, we get uh, eight times 50,000 on top, 600,000 on the bottom. Take it one step further, that's 400,000 over 600,000, or a hurdle rate of 66.67%. That means that for an investor to get their, their required rate of return, they would need to own two-thirds of this company in order to get it. So that sounds pretty steep. Let's take a look at another one. This time, we're, everything is the same except we're going to use public earnings. We're looking at a public company now instead of a private one. The investment amount stays the same at 50000 um, uh, This time, when we plug in our number, numbers, we're going to use an earnings multiple of 20 instead of our private earnings multiple of 5 that we used the last time. So as we multiply this out, now we've got 8 times 50 on top, but we've got 2.4 million in, uh, in the denominator. So 400,000 over 2.4 million gives us a hurdle rate of 16.67%. This starts to look much more affordable and much more doable for an investor. Because the public uh, company is valued higher because, of, because it offers better liquidity, um, it's valued higher than the private one. So at exit, the investor needs to own a lot less uh, in order to achieve their desired IRR. Okay, that covers our agenda for this video. I will see you on the next video.